Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to speak about remote sensing and I was assigned this topic and so it's going to give you a pretty broad overview of remote sensing in the Southern Ocean and an overview of existing techniques in some future directions. First I'm going to talk about the problem of remote sensing, what we need to do, the challenges. I'm also going to speak about scales of remote sensing and then I'm going to give some examples at a broad ocean basin scale. So I'm going to go through a variety of different examples of satellite remote sensing that we can use to study whales in the Southern Ocean. And then I'm also going to give some examples at a much finer scale, an in situ scale, um, actually overlapping with some of the talks we've already seen on looking at prey and behavior. And then finally give some conclusions and some dis discussion. So the problem we have is that in order to better understand whales in the Southern Ocean, we need to be able to directly observe their physical and biological environment at multiple spatial and temporal scales. So it's a very broad issue, but it's really, really important for us to be able to understand what's going on in the entire Southern Oce Ocean ecosystem and then be able to scale these things all the way down to individual animals and their behavior. So remote sensing provides covariates that will allow us to build habitat and density models to be able to understand the relationships. They also provide observations of productivity and prey distributions and give us very, very important crucial monitoring and validation data. So remote sensing is a very big key to what we need to do. So to talk about scales, um, I like to look at scales in terms of space and time and this is a classic kind of plot to look at log time on the x-axis and log area on the y-axis and then to look at different kinds of ecosystem functions. And if you're looking at patches of phytoplankton, you might be looking at things that are d dynamic in a very short time frame and maybe looking at some small patches. You may be looking at the zooplankton that are feeding on them and the small prey that are feeding on them at a slightly larger scale. And if you're looking at cetaceans and the migratory behavior of cetaceans, you might be looking at an ocean basin scale. And we may be looking at cetaceans at different scales. So this here is looking at the scale if you're looking at the entire migratory behavior. And Alex just showed some great um, examples of you know, long distance migratory behavior. So this would be the entire southern ocean basin scale. And satellite observations are the best types of observations to be able to look at patterns at these types of scales. But when we're trying to look at dynamics down in smaller patch sizes and shorter periods of time, we need to look at different kinds of tools and satellite observations may help us some, in some cases, but we need to look at things more closely. So when we're looking at the foraging behavior, and Ari just showed some examples of foraging behavior, we may be looking at that at a very different spatial and temporal scale. And so down here at the scale of um, you know, animal movement and behavior and the scale of minutes and meters, um, we're going to be looking at very, very you know, orders of magnitude differences in terms of the observations. One of the things that we're finding is a challenge, and uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, you should say what your take-home message is at the beginning. So my take-home message at the end of this talk is going to be that actually the middle scale is the one we're having the most trouble with with remote sensing because we have lots of cool developments at the very broad ocean basin scale and lots of neat new innovations at the very fine scale, but trying to get something in that mid-range is, is problematic. So looking at within foraging region and season scales are where we're having some trouble on getting the technology to tell us what we need. So this might be looking at something, just to give you an example, if you were studying the behavior within a smaller region for a few months, um, it's harder, harder for us to be able to get um, imagery and analysis to cover these areas consistently. And what's the big reason for that? Well, the big reason is going to be cloud cover, um, the dynamics of the weather patterns in the ocean at these places makes it difficult to get consistent kinds of data collected. So cloud and ice cover is one of the biggest challenges in this mid-range. And so we end up often taking imagery that we're able to get from satellite or aircraft and aggregating it together to make up for the fact that we have all sorts of holes in the data due to the weather patterns. So we end up aggregating over time and we also aggregate over space. And what we end up doing with that is often creating new products um, that are composite images that take data that's collected over larger areas and longer time periods so that, that we can um, cancel out the holes in the cloud cover. 
so in some of the products I'm going to show you in a few minutes, some of the satellite imagery, what we end up doing is aggregating many, many different um, satellite images, sometimes building climatologies that might take tens of thousands of satellite images to create maps that show us um, seasonal or monthly patterns over decades of time. And so this is a very common thing that people do, aggregating the data together. So here we're looking at some raw, on the left-hand side, some raw MODIS Terra images um, for um, sea surface temperature. And you can see a window there where we can barely see through the western Antarctic Peninsula. This is actually a time period that Ari and I were out on a trip and in a two-month um, cruise, that was the best image we got. And most of the others look like this, and, um, or like that. And so if you've been into the, the real Southern Ocean, um, it's actually not a great place to do satellite imagery work. So what we end up doing is often taking composites of images and combining them together to extract out environmental features. But we do that at the loss of precision in space and time. So what I'd like to do is show some examples of some of the imagery that is, is available now and it's, it's much easier to access now and there's many tools available to get um, a lot of new imagery and to be able to make use of it. So I'm going to go through very quickly just to show you some examples of the kinds of products that, that you can get your hands on these days. So this is an example here of um, sea surface temperature data from the NASA Terra um, MODIS system. And what I've got aggregated on the right there, which was actually just produced a couple days ago, is um, a composite image of sea surface temperature built from all of the imagery for the Southern Ocean from 1999 to the present. So about 13 years of data went into that, so more than 10,000 satellite images combined. And these are broken out by um, seasons. We also can do this down to monthly data. So it gives us very high quality data, but it puts us up into that space time plot where you're looking at things over large areas and long periods of time. But we're able to get uh, very clean data once we um, do that kind of aggregation. In a similar way, this is data looking at chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is an extremely good variable to be able to use to look at productivity in the ocean. And this is from the MODIS Aqua sensor. And we're also looking here, I'm just showing you just the seasonal averages. These are using 91 day, approximately 90, 91 day um, averages for um, creating seasons for the Southern Ocean. And this also can be aggregated down to weekly and monthly types of data. A different type of sensor, many, many people may not be as used to this. Many people I think are used to seeing imagery of temperature and chlorophyll. Um, but also altimetry data is quite commonly used. Um, altimetry data gives us um, information on sea surface heights and sea surface height directly isn't as much of an interest to ecologists or whale biologists, but then the products that can be created from this looking at change in sea surface heights can tell us a lot about the dynamics of oceanography. So here we're looking at seven day third degree global data from 1993 to the present using the Aviso data system. And here also just to show you some examples are seasonal products created from this. Another type of satellite imagery that's very crucial to the analysis of whales in the Southern Ocean is ice covered. And there are several different products. The ice cover data um, is actually um, easier to collect due through cloud cover because it's using a microwave type of sensor that's able to penetrate through clouds. This is looking at a particular product that's a 6.25 kilometer um, resolution imagery for ice data and then also um, looking at it aggregated over time. One unfortunate thing is that the particular sensor we're looking at here stopped working a couple months ago and stopped responding and so we're waiting to see what's going to come from that. So um, satellites do break and this one is now broken. Um, but this is looking at data aggregated right now into seasons for ice coverage and um, at six, six kilometer, um, it's actually giving us pretty high resolution imagery to use to characterize ocean basin ice conditions. I mentioned that the data itself is um, not as interesting as finding the products from it and things like that sea height data and other kinds of data can be used to extract out more dynamic oceanographic information. 
So one of the things uh, my lab works on is taking satellite imagery and then building tools to extract out oceanographic features that are more interesting to ecologists and whale biologists. And this just shows an example here of a tool to break out where do we find fronts in ecosystems. So, sorry. And so what we try to do is statistically look at areas where we find high gradients and changes in temperature or changes in sea heights that allow us to see where we might have aggregations in the ocean. And frontal systems and eddies and other kinds of dynamic features are often more interesting to biologists because that's where prey is being aggregated and where predators often are attracted. And so this is looking here at a nighttime sea surface temperature front probability map for the Southern Ocean. And this kind of information I find to be much more interesting to use than just looking at raw temperature. As a matter of fact, temperature in the Southern Ocean is kind of a nice gradient from cold to colder. And so, so here looking at where we might find some more dynamics is, is much more interesting. Um, I'm just going to click through quickly just a 12 month climatology of fronts, but what you can see here is a lot more detail in terms of fine grain patterns. And so this is looking at um, you know, 12 months of the year and going through and trying to look at where do we find these, um, these kind of more detailed, um, more um, precise locations that might be of interest. So if we're looking at satellite tags, looking at whale, where whales are migrating, um, we might be able to find better correlations between um, where they're foraging and where we're seeing this kind of activity in the ocean. There's several other kinds of variables. There's many different kinds that you can show. One, just to show you an example here, is looking at mean eddy kinetic energy, where we're looking at just the raw energy fluxes in the ocean. And then looking at eddy centroids and tracks. Um, I have an animation, I won't bother to show it, but we ha what we can do is identify individual eddies and then track where they move over time. And so eddies are often known to aggregate prey and then predators might be finding the edges of these eddies and then tracking them as well. And here the red lines are the tracks of cyclonic eddies and the blue lines are, are anti-cyclonic eddies. So a lot of this data is used as empirical data, measured data in its raw form, but also there's models out there, oceanographic models that assimilate this data to refine the models. And one example to show here is called the HICOM model. And this model is a very detailed, this is a 12th degree, um, 12th degree, um, one twelfth of a degree um, resolution model to show oceanographic variables. And this is a model, so it isn't inf influenced by cloud cover and other things, but it assimilates information from um, sensors. And it can give us um, hi hypothetical locations of many other oceanographic features below the surface. So things like um, layer densities and other kinds of information. So quite a bit of interesting stuff. I have another animation here, but I'm going to Skip that. If people want to see it, I can show it to you. It's really pretty. It's kind of nice to watch it kind of flux in and out. Um, but I'm going to save things to show the animation at the end that Ari didn't show. So, okay. Um, so that was at the broad scale, ocean basin scale. So we've got lots of cool stuff that's going on at the ocean basin scale, and we're getting better at that all the time. So I don't think we have the problem solved, but we're making great progress. I want to show a couple of examples at the more local scale, in situ measurements. And we've seen some examples already. So the first one is active sonar um, and active acoustics prey mapping. So down at the scale of whale foraging, we need to be able to do a better job of measuring where the prey are in real time, co-occurring with the animals. And so Ari already showed some examples, so I'm going to go back and, and show mainly not from the tagging side, but from the passive acoustic side of measuring the prey. So this is some data from two recent cruises, 2009 and 2010. And we're going to show this animation here, hopefully at the end of this session, um, on looking at mapping prey at different scales. So we were using shipborne um, acoustic um, echo sounders, using towed fish acoustic echo sounders, as well as using echo sounders attached to a small um, rib boat, a zodiac boat. And I'm going to focus in on the, um, on the smaller rib boat and how we follow the animals and get uh, echo sounding while we have tags on the animals. So here we're showing um, three different kinds of echo sounders mounted at the same time operationally. So shipborne, um, a towed fish, and then um, using a small rib boat 
that's outfitted with um, an EK60 with 38 and 120 kilohertz echo sounders. And this just shows um, rigging up some of the equipment in the Southern Ocean. It's um, kind of a little more challenging every morning to have to kind of build the whole system on the Zodiac and put it over the side, so it takes a little bit of effort. And this shows, Ari showed some of the examples of tagging. So there's Ari tagging a whale, but also following behind was a follow boat that was following close to the whales and doing echo sounding. So we were able to get three dimensional patterns of krill density um, while we actually had whales swimming in the, in the vicinity. And here's also showing at the point, at this point we have the echo sounder flipped up while we're traveling, but then we'd flip it back down. But those are the 38 and 120 kilohertz echo sounders. Um, I had an animation for this, but I just turned it into a couple slides just to show you. Um, but this is looking at tag data, detag data, which already showed examples of. And then the fluke symbols are showing where whales were diving. And what we can see here is and just showing you an example of the depths of the whale dives and then the little bins, the little points, are um, looking at krill um, that has been binned into depth ranges and we're looking at the density and volume of krill that we have at these different depths. So we're actually able to start creating these kind of near real-time maps showing us where whales are moving, where they're feeding, and what is the actual prey distribution in 3D, which is, I think, kind of cool. I like this stuff. Okay. And I have, video, I have some animations of this if you want to see them later as well. Okay. Um, another thing that we found at this finer scale is that the animals are responding to environmental conditions at a more local scale. So we can get that ice imagery, you know, at six kilometer or 25 kilometers for the Southern Ocean. But when we actually get into bays and other areas in in the um, in the Western Antarctic Peninsula, for example, um, we find that there was differences in the distribution of where we're finding minke whales and humpback whales. And a lot of that is, seems to be breaking out along the ice gradients. And so you need a finer grain tools to be able to measure this. And so these two field seasons, one in 2009 and 2010, we did quite a bit of survey work throughout this area, both years, but there were significant differences in ice coverage. And this is showing the biomass estimates of krill in the area. And you can see in 2009, we have krill that's closer to shore. 2010, it's farther offshore. And this is also showing now humpback group sizes based on that. And you can see almost no separation between the two years for the humpbacks. And the big difference here is we had more ice in one year than the other. So it's fairly generalized stuff, but what we want to be able to do is to actually get down to the point of making more precise measurements. And this is looking at the um, group sizes of humpbacks between the two years, 2009 and 2010. It's very common on these types of cruises for observers, marine mammal observers, to also be noting estimates of ice coverage, but it's extremely difficult for humans to be able to estimate precisely what ice cover is, and it's very hard for them to give um, precise um, estimates of different classes of ice. And so that's something that's difficult to do, and it's very easy for people to overestimate ice coverage or have a lot of variation between observers. So this last year in 2010, um, we tried out a new tool. This is just a prototype. And Roland Arsenault from University of New Hampshire developed the technology for this to take an automated camera and then create really nice panoramic views. I think we might be able to fund some of the research in the future just by selling posters of the neat pictures. Um, but what we did take was these automatic um, camera views where the camera is literally moving along and taking many, many, many frames and then breaking them out and geo-rectifying them um, and using a GIS system after that to be able to analyze the ice coverage. And so this is looking at forward looking in front of the ship and that's many, you know, 30 or more images that are sewn together to create one scene. And then we'd extract out of that a sample and then be able to classify that sample into different types of ice coverage. So here we're looking at open water, grease ice, unconsolidated ice, consolidated ice, different kinds of densities, and we can actually get much more of a quantitative estimate of local ice patterns instead of just having an observer say, eh, it looks like 20% ice. Okay. 
and also we can reference the original images so the people going back and reinterpreting the data can um, click on it and actually see what it looks like to a human. And this is showing an example here of a transect where you can, you can put these together in time series and then relate them to the patterns of the observed animals you're seeing or if you have tagged animals in the area to be able to, res to associate the ice cover changes um, to those animals. Okay, just to wrap up, um, I mentioned two things. One is that we have a lot of really, really well-defined products now being developed for remote sensing at the ocean basin scale. And it's getting better all the time, and the work's never done, but we're inc increasingly developing long-term archives of imagery, and we're creating better algorithms for being able to extract information out at that ocean basin scale. We also are creating lots of new cool innovations at this site scale, and we're going to hear more about some of them in the next couple talks. But what I'm finding is that the biggest challenge is in this intermediate scale, um, where you're trying to look at things that are maybe not that day, and maybe not an entire year, but things that are in that intermediate scale in, in space and time, um, because we're having trouble coming up with imagery and tools that allow us to bridge that. So I see that as being one of the big challenges um, in the next decade, is how do we broaden things from in situ scale, scaling up, and from ocean basin scale and scaling down, and how do we get things in that intermediate scale. So that's it. Can we run that on this one? Or?